Hello everyone, this is Jermaine Edwards and on behalf of Data Torrent and 451 Research, I would like to welcome you and say thank you for attending today's webcast titled, Why Fast Big Data Apps Are Becoming the New Normal for Business Success. Leading off today's discussion will be Matt Aslett, who is Research Director of Data and Platforms and Analytics at 451 Research. Following Matt will be Nathan Trueblood, who is Vice President of Product Management at Data Turret. Just a couple quick housekeeping items before we get started. To ask a question, simply type in the question box on your screen below and we'll get to as many as possible. We will respond to all unanswered questions via email after the webcast concludes. This presentation and slides are available for download after the webinar. And finally, please provide feedback at the end of the webinar. And with that, I'll hand it over to Matt. Uh, thanks, Jermaine, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us on, uh, on today's webinar. Uh, as Jermaine said, we're, we're going to be talking today about fast big data applications and how they're becoming the new normal for business success. Before we get into that, I'll very briefly uh, introduce you to 451 Research. For anybody who's not come across the, the company before, uh, hopefully you have. Well, we are an IT research and advisory company. Uh, we've been around since 2000. We have a couple of hundred employees, including over 120 analysts and over 2,000 clients, which includes technology and service providers, as well as corporate advisory, finance, professional services, and IT decision makers. And, and the last thing I'll point on this slide is that this next uh, data point, 70,000 plus uh, IT professionals, business users, and consumers within our uh, 451 Alliance research community. So those are people that are not necessarily direct clients of 451 Research, but actually many of them work for companies that, that are, but they are uh, practitioners, people out there in the field using technology as part of their daily working lives and obviously their home lives and those two increasingly kind of intersecting. And they help shape our you know, view on the market by taking part in surveys and interviews and, and, and in return for doing so, they do get access free access to our research, so an increasingly important part of the business, and, and actually we'll be, we'll be uh, presenting some of the, the data points you'll see in, in the webinar today have, have come from that, uh, <clears throat> from that source. So uh, with that, um, yeah, the, the, the focus initially I want to talk about here is, is the drive towards becoming you know, data-driven, and we, we hear a lot about this, you know, most companies out there are increasing their investment in data processing and analytics and machine learning software uh, with a desire to become more data driven. So <clears throat> you know, what, what does that mean? What we see is that data and, and specifically kind of the rapid processing of data is a key driver in enabling companies to grasp the opportunities presented by uh, digital transformation in order to deliver competitive uh, advantage. Now, there was a few buzzwords uh, in there, uh, and so we need to perhaps un unpack some of those. So let's start with digital transformation. Obviously, this is something that everybody's talking about, and you know, it's a fair question to say, well, you know, everyone's talking about it, but how many organizations are actually doing it? Um, as you can see, this is some, some research that's come from our, our survey of, of end users, and what we see is that actually a, a significant proportion of organizations um, are actively taking part in, in digital digital transformation projects, we actually see that 47% of the companies we, we spoke to, or the individuals we spoke to um, um, earlier last year, you know, are, work for companies that are in the process and actually have a formal strategy for digitizing their processes already. In addition, another 25% have already started on you know, uh, siloed digital transformation projects, but with uh, without uh, at this stage uh, an overarching strategy, but but obviously probably working towards that, and another 21% are, are currently in the planning stage. So what we see, you know, based on this, um, is that if if you uh, or your your organisation is in that 7% where you currently do not have a digital transformation strategy, you you know are significantly at risk of getting uh, you know disrupted or overtaken or or, or, or displaced. Uh, by uh, you know your competitors, um, you know the 93% who are you know in the process, and especially obviously that, that 47% that are actually <clears throat> have a formal strategy in place. Now, what does that mean in terms of having a you know a strategy for digital transformation? Well, it you know it does depend obviously from organisation to organisation, um, 
But you know, we see that there, there's a couple of key pillars here that that, that spring up. When we, again, this is from uh, data that we've collected from from speaking to our you know our, our um, four five one alliance user base, and we see some key aspects coming up again and again. Customer experience it tends to be uh, you know not exclusively but tends to be at the heart of a digital transformation project. You know, we see here you know over thirty seven percent are focused specifically on creating innovative products and services to to drive better customer experience. Um, it also has implications for some of the other things here. So we see efficiency is, is another core uh, driver, um, and uh, specifically, for example, around you know better uh, uh, serving customers and reducing uh, customer friction. Um, even you know if we think about it from a risk perspective, and actually you see 48% are, are thinking about digital transformation from a risk perspective. Um, you know, often you know there's, there's multiple elements to, to risk. There's internal risk, but but obviously one of those is actually uh, you know, and we <laughs> this is obviously in the news very much this week in terms of how organisations treat their customers' data, um, and that is something that organisations are having to be very cognizant about. You know, for regulatory uh, and other sort of uh, you know legal reasons, and and you know also you know agility is another key driver. You know, harnessing the power of data and analytics and business intelligence and machine learning to be more agile, uh, to make decisions more quickly. And that you know, is something that we see a lot of organizations are, are focused on. It's, it's what is driving, I'd say, the you know, current wave of, of adoption of, of, of analytics and machine learning technologies. If we think about, you know, to use there the phrase, the sort of wave of adoption, and, and one of the things that's really interesting that came out of a survey we did at the beginning of this year where we were asking our uh, um, 451 Alliance about um, uh, you know, their top priorities uh, for, for the organization in 2018. And this was asking specifically when I say sort of IT decision makers what were their top priorities. And, and as you can see here, number one, by actually quite a long margin with business intelligence and visualization. Um, you know, not so much a, a surprise that it, that it scored well, but considering there's other things in here like machine learning, AI, big data, containers, serverless, uh, blockchain, you know, it, it was uh, it was quite interesting to see that it not only was was uh, business intelligence and visualization the number one priority, but actually quite far ahead of, of anything else. And especially if we actually then asked as well, well, which of these technologies do you already have, you know, adopted within your organization? And again, you know, by a significant margin, business intelligence and, and visualization is the most widely adopted of those. And so there's a number of things we can we can sort of take from this. But I think you know one of them is that you know business intelligence uh, adoption is not you know it's it, it's not something that you you you, know, you adopt a specific product and then you're done. Clearly, we see this. I uh, talked about waves of adoption. We've seen waves of technologies coming through, serving things like self-service. Uh, business intelligence and visualization, for example. Obviously, uh, you know, new wave of, of technologies dealing with real-time data analytics and streaming data analytics. So it is very much something that is an ongoing, um, you know, project for organizations, and, and it's something where you've got different also departments and, uh, and, and, and uh, line of business groups within an organization which will be moving at, at different paces and, and also have different requirements for the type of, of BI and visualization technologies that they need. Now, if we think about, you know, we talked about sort of data-driven and some of the high-level uh, concepts, but, you know, what are the goals? What are organizations trying to do? Obviously, there's multiple things, but, we, you know, we, we try and uh, generalize, um, you know, in order to, to, to you know, get this uh, across in as quickly as possible. And what we see is things falling into a couple of, 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 of main buckets here. We see it coming down to really uh, new revenue opportunities and improving operational efficiencies. Um, and, and very often, you know, companies have different projects addressing both of these. Um, we see it's not uh, uncommon for a company to start with operational efficiencies and then move on to new revenue opportunities. But, you know, there may be different groups within an organization, as I say, moving at different paces. But we do see, though, that, you know, companies are trying to take advantage of new data sources and combine that with the information that they, they obviously already have about their customers, their businesses, their competitors, to develop new innovative applications and services as well as uh, as well as operate more efficiently. 
Um, specifically with regards to you know new revenue opportunities, you know there, there's a bunch of different uh, areas in which we see this happening. Obviously, sort of combining data from devices and sensors and customers and analyzing that in real time, uh, you know, to react better. And, and a lot of IoT use cases obviously springing up right now. We see the, the, the ability or the, the desire to pursue new opportunities in adjacent markets. For example, you know, a product manufacturer looking to move into sort of predictive maintenance services and, 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 and identify and, and create new data-driven uh, you know, revenue opportunities. Um, and also just accelerating time to market, identifying the most valuable customers, for example, and launching special uh, programs for them to, to boost loyalty is a, is a good example of that. And I think what we see is, I mean, going back to what we were saying earlier, customer experience is not necessarily driving every single sort of, of uh, project, but we do see, you know, it's the common thread that, that often is, uh, you know, linking a lot of different uh, inno innovative projects together in terms of, you know, identifying the core um, core um, customers and, uh, and responding to them and improving that experience. Um, obviously, in terms of operational efficiencies, again, there's multiple areas that this can happen. Optimization of existing processes is obviously, you know, a key area. So optimizing marketing spend or supply chains, for example. Um, also, though, you know, streamlining internal processes. Um, uh, and also, you know, we talked about sort of regulatory concerns. And obviously, you know, that is not necessarily an area in which organizations can try and generate revenue, but it is certainly an area in which the companies can try and uh, reduce costs, accelerate their ability to respond to requirements, and obviously, hopefully, uh, you know, avoid, um, you know, costs in terms of sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, fines and, and another another kind of, um, um, uh, you know, again, hit by, by other, other things. So in terms of how organizations are trying to do this, um, you know, we talk a lot, and we have, I think, as an industry, we focus a lot in recent years around things like data velocity, and obviously for variety and, and volume. And I think, you know, velocity and the speed of data is, is absolutely something that a lot of organizations need to be focused on. The rate at which data is being produced is accelerating all the time. It's a valid concern that companies need to address with stream processing technologies, for example. But what we've seen is it isn't simply about processing data more quickly. Um, it's actually, you know, we talk a lot about frequency as kind of the, the other side of the coin. You know, the, the requirement and desire from organizations to increase the rate of analysis in order to generate more accurate and more timely business intelligence. So more frequent analysis requires actually a bit of a change of thinking. It's not just about processing and analyzing data more quickly. It's about processing and analyzing data continuously and, and more frequently um, you know, analyzing that data. Um, you know, one of the things we've seen in this is that, you know, the, the ability to query your historical data more frequently doesn't mean you have fresh insight. You know, that you need to be continuously updating that, that data, as we said. But also, it's, there's some conceptual changes that have to happen here because, you know, thinking a lot of early, especially early sort of event processing or stream processing projects, there was still this mentality that there's, you know, a beginning and, a, and an end of the process. And it's, you know, it's, it's a batch process, but still even micro batch processing is still, you know, you know, batch processing. There's still an assumed beginning and an end. And instead, you know, enterprises really need to focus on, uh, you know, this idea of sort of a continuous uh, data integration and processing uh, uh, process. So we've talked actually a, a, a fair bit um, in, in recent months um, about this idea of continuous data integration. And it's important to, to make a distinction here between that and continuous integration, which is obviously you know, it, within a development uh, practice, developers pushing code into a shared repository as part of a, an auto, automated build and testing process. But you know, frankly, we, we borrowed some of the ideas from that. And we think that actually those key stages in a continuous integration and delivery process, so plan, code, build, test, release, deploy, operate, measure, and then back to plan, um, you know, those things can equally be applied to the, the, the concepts around the process of developing, deploying, and managing data integration pipelines that are responsive to changing business uh, and data processing requirements. And what we also see is that you know, managing uh, and automating um, uh, multiple data flows is an important aspect of this idea of continuous data integration that elevates it beyond simply integrating data in real time. 
So, you know, as data processing events are streamed into the enterprise, they may trigger predefined data integration pipelines or workflows in business operations, which obviously need to be managed and monitored as part of a, a continuous data integration approach. And you know this uh, you know brings us on to you know the the the, the topic of sort of uh, you know data lakes and, and data streams and how those can can potentially coexist because you know we we think that it's important that this shift to continuous data integration and more frequent data analysis it obviously doesn't negate the need for batch based processing of data at rest we're not talking about everything uh, you know being uh, data in motion you know the data lake or the data warehouse whatever you know your your data at rest is likely to be an ultimate de destination for those streams of, of data in motion as they flew, flow sorry, through the organization. Um, more importantly, however, actually the analysis of historical data at rest can be used to, to you know, for example, to, to, to generate the analytic models um, that are applied to streaming data to deliver real-time analysis. So a great example of this would be things like recommendation engines or, or churn prevention or fraud prevention, where the decision in terms of the, the delivery of their recommendation or the decision in, in terms of sort of preventing churn or fraud needs to be taken in real time on that streaming data as that event occurs. But the model to, you know, to deliver that decision is, has obviously been, been uh, developed and, and trained using historical data at rest. So it's very much a, you know, a combination of, of the two. And you know, we see this you know, here in, in, as we, we illustrate it uh, in, oops, sorry, uh, in terms of the, you know, the, the overall architecture. And what this highlights is an important point, which I think it can potentially actually be, be sort of easily overlooked. Um, when we, 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 we tend to focus on the underlying data processing capability. So a lot of, as I said, a lot of focus over recent years on you know, Hadoop and Spark and you know, data streaming and different data streaming projects and the concept of the data lake versus the data warehouse. But you know, all of those things, whether you're processing data in batch or stream or both, you know, it depends actually on the nature of the application. What is the business case? What is the application that is 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 re reliant on those data processing capabilities? And it's the development of the application to take advantage of that data processing that's key to adoption of that entire stack within the organisation. And and so we, you know, continuing, you know, almost the uh, you know the sort of lake and stream uh, analogy. Um, what we would say is that you know that continuous flow of data throughout the organisation doesn't you know in, in in and of itself it doesn't generate insights it's just a flow of data. Um, but so what enterprises need to invest in is building you know the equivalent you know for the uh, the imagery here the equivalent of the hydroelectric power station the applications that actually harness that flow of data and convert it into actionable insights. And it's, it's those applications, actually, that deliver the new revenue opportunities, the improved operational efficiencies that we talked about in terms of organizations uh, you know, looking to become uh, more data-driven. So that's just you know, a brief sort of overview of the, the landscape as we see it and some of the trends that we see that are, that are driving this space. Um, in terms of, sort of the, some of the, the key takeaways uh, that, that we would highlight, you know, we see that enterprises are absolutely looking to take advantage of new data sources and combine that with the information they already hold about their customers, their businesses, their competitors, to develop new innovative applications and services, as well as operate more efficient, efficiently as part of this drive you know, to become more data driven, to, to uh, take advantage of digital transformation projects, you know, to, to uh, survive and thrive uh, compared to some of their competitors. I think you know, more frequent analysis is a significant aspect of that, but it requires a change of thinking. It isn't uh, just about processing and analyzing data more quickly. It's actually you know, more frequent data analysis at the same time doesn't negate the need for batch-based processing of data at rest. It's about processing and analyzing data continuously as it flows through the organization. And, uh, and lastly, that, that continuous flow of data, it's, uh, you know, as we said, in and of itself doesn't generate insights. It's the applications and the investment in developing that next generation of applications that harness that flow of data and that converts it into actionable, actionable insight and will, will deliver you know, the transformational effects that organizations are looking for. 
So with that, this is it. That's just a brief overview of the market as we see it and the trends that we see it. So I'll hand you over to Nathan now who can talk to you about, uh, about data times and where it fits within the landscape we've described and perhaps I think provide some, some good examples of the sort of things we've been talking about. Um, we'll, I'll be back later. We'll, we'll, take, we'll take some questions once we've completed the uh, presentation. So please do uh, drop those into the, uh, uh, the question um, box and we'll get to those at the end. But for now, I'll hand you over to Nathan. Great. Thanks, Matt. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you virtually. So Matt's just given us a really good overview of what 451 is seeing in the market. And so uh, now I'd like to take you through a little bit about what we're seeing in the field with customers. So real-time and stream data processing at scale is becoming the new normal for large enterprises. Well, what we think that really means is that businesses uh, simply want to get insight and take action as close as possible to the time that something happens. So that's why everyone's looking at real time and looking at eventing. How, how can I react more quickly to changing conditions? Furthermore, with all the innovation and machine learning and artificial intelligence, businesses are figuring out new and really compelling ways to use data to drive automated insight and action. So, we're living in a pretty exciting time right now when it comes to data processing and, and really the IT discoveries that we're making every day. But just as businesses are learning to be more responsive with data, they're also realizing that they have to ship data-driven products and services more quickly. So the pace of innovation and technology is such that businesses can't wait one or two years to harness what's taking place in big data and data science. If they're going to remain competitive, they have to harness that stuff uh, and ship new applications quickly. So as I, I'll explain over the next few minutes, at Data Torrent, we harness open source innovation in big data to help our customers be data driven with real time data. And at the same time, we help our customers deliver new capabilities, new applications that drive uh, revenue and increase operational efficiency, as, as Matt was mentioning earlier. So Matt mentioned digital transformation, and this is, uh, I, I feel like a veteran of the buzzword wars, and this is a, a popular buzzword these days. So as you heard you know, previously from Matt, uh, quite a few enterprises are undergoing digital transformation. So as someone who jokes about buzzwords, you know, what does this really mean when people say digital transformation? Digital transformation is really simply about getting more responsive to your customer and changing business conditions. So the more responsive you are to your customer, the more competitive you're going to be, and thus you win. And so in order to be responsive, and in order to know how to respond, uh, you need to have the data. So businesses are discovering new ways to instrument and measure the customer, the products, your business operation, and so forth. And then data science and machine learning and big data innovation are giving us the new applications and the new ways to use that data to predict and respond quickly to changing conditions. And then the last thing we're seeing is that uh, we're seeing quite a few uh, enterprises, the successful ones, are learning to harness what's going on in the technology ecosystem, to harness that innovation and ship new applications quickly. So just as Matt was talking about sort of continuous data integration, uh, digital transformation is also about shipping new capabilities more quickly. And so the application lifecycle that we're seeing out there uh, is shortening. So Matt mentioned earlier you know, that in the IT Pulse survey, enterprises can you know, continue to indicate that business intelligence and data visualization remain top priority. So this, of course, tells me that we're not even close to being, you know, quote, unquote, done with business intelligence. What's happening is that uh, enterprises are finding more ways to, than ever to instrument the business and the customer and so forth. So everyone's talking about IoT, um, and certainly IoT is attracting a lot of attention. Uh, to us, IoT simply means a new way to measure the world around us and become more data-driven. And quite frequently, the IoT devices, the sensors, the things that are sending off the data are delivering those, that data as events, as event streams, um, and that's where the stream processing and the real-time processing come in. So whether it's you know, whether wearable devices for healthcare or industrial manufacturing, plant sensors, we're just finding all kinds of new ways to collect real-time data for insight and action. You know, as, a, as a data guy, uh, I really love the quote that's credited to Peter Drucker, which says, uh, you can't improve what you don't measure. So if you look at that trend of business, business intelligence and instrumentation, it's just a constant drive towards uh, being able to make improvements. So 
So as you heard earlier, 451 uh, highlighted sort of the importance of adopting a culture of being data-driven um, if you want your business to succeed. But you know, what are the applications? What are the streaming or real-time data-driven applications that are going to contribute to that success? So what we're seeing in the field with our customers is uh, an emerging pattern of applications, as illustrated, as uh, you can see over on the right. And really what this boils down to is customers are looking for new ways to drive revenue or increase operational efficiency. And so uh, the, the use cases you see around this wheel, it's not specific to one industry. These are the kinds of use cases that we're seeing in helping customers to deliver into production. Um, and if you look, it really comes down to things like uh, product recommendations, which help to drive revenue, or you know, sentiment analysis, customer 360, those kinds of things uh, can help increase customer satisfaction, all of which can help contribute to the bottom line. And then over on the right, you see a lot of the use cases that have to do with protecting the business or driving efficiency uh, into the business. So certainly fraud prevention is one of those ones that Matt mentioned earlier, and that's a particular area we see a lot of interest when it comes to event and stream processing. Uh, again, the sooner I can know that something bad is happening and I can and stop that, I'm going to protect my business. Um, but that also applies to things like you know, predictive maintenance or improving uh, fulfillment processes, things like that, where everything you do to drive efficiency in real time out of the organization is going to contribute to the bottom line. Now, the other thing that we're seeing uh, is that Quite often, when a customer comes to us and they have one of these use cases, like fraud prevention, for example, um, once they figure out how to use the real-time data that they have and to deliver that application, they quickly see opportunity to deliver a lot more of these applications around the wheel. So uh, it's kind of an interesting effect. Once you solve one of these use cases, you quickly see how the others are possible, and they're actually interrelated in that once you start being more data-driven and harnessing the, that data in one application, you see a way to share uh, data and share outcomes across these applications. And so it's another interesting trend we're seeing. For example, if I know everything about my customer up to the second with a Customer 360 application, that can contribute heavily to the effectiveness of my fraud prevention application or fulfillment, uh, content personalization, and so forth. So these, these applications, once you get started, kind of have a network effect um, all of which are in the service of helping you drive your business forward, either making money or protecting the business and saving money. So this brings up another fact uh, and another key aspect of digital transformation, which is the need to ship products, services, and capabilities faster. And in a lot of ways, this is what's meant by uh, agility as one of the key pillars of digital transformation. Um, it's not just uh, agility with data, it's agility with what you're doing with the data, with the applications and the services and the insights that you're uh, getting from that data. So really what we're seeing is gone are the days where an application's life cycle is measured in years. You know, if you recall Matt's uh, comment earlier about the continuous data integration, you know, the, there is a really uh, big drive towards the continuous uh, development and delivery of applications and services. And you know, not every organization needs to do this at the rate of you know, a new release every single day, um, but certainly we're seeing a lot of pressure to deliver applications you know, within a couple of months, um, and those applications may have a shorter life cycle. Um, we're seeing this in particular for things like business intelligence, where a new application might be needed to monitor uh, a new product rollout, a new sales and marketing campaign, and so forth. And you can't wait 18 months to tool up the organization to support that launch. There's changes happening all of the time, and so you need to ship new kinds of business intelligence uh, capabilities as quickly as you can. So in a funny way, it's a lot like what we see happening. Uh, everyone's watching the electric car industry. You know, it's kind of analogous to how Tesla is disrupting the auto industry. So in, in a funny way, their car is delivered as a platform. It looks a lot more like software than an automobile these days, but they're, they're, their car is delivered as a platform. And the capabilities of that car are delivered continuously with frequent over-the-air updates and new applications. So that you know, screenshot there is you know, the, the Tesla software update. So if you compare that to the other car companies who develop a new model, 
uh, you know, takes them numerous years to do so. Once that new model is out there, they expect it to remain competitive and in the marketplace for the next three to five years with a fixed set of features. Problem with that is it's not responsive and it doesn't do enough to harness innovation. So, you know, even in the world of the automobile, we're seeing the need towards delivering a platform that can then be continuously updated over its life cycle. So becoming data-driven, getting more responsive with streaming and real-time analytics, it all sounds great. Um, but achieving the vision is a really big challenge. Um, and it's a challenge especially for large enterprises um, and, and in particular kinds of customers that we work with. So you know, most of you likely have an existing business to run. You have demanding customers, uh, you know, a crowded marketplace, and so you can't simply hit pause while you retool the organization. So the large-scale enterprises we serve have some serious challenges, like you know, how do I integrate real-time and historical data? You know, how do I take advantage of my unique data assets? You know, I want to be more data-driven, ship applications, but I have to think carefully about the cost to serve my customers at scale. So simply rushing headlong into this without thinking about the cost is not the right idea either. And then, you know, I mentioned the rapid delivery of applications, um, but then on the technical side, there's a lot of challenges around you know, development complexity, how do I get these things into production, and so forth. So, you know, big business faces a big challenge, which is they have to do something uh, about what's going on in the market. They need to undergo digital transformation for the reasons that Matt stated. Um, but you know, you still have a business to run. And we're seeing this in particular across uh, the following industries that, I mean, that we work with, um, but I think this is where the, the challenge is particularly acute. They have to harness the real-time data, they have to ship new applications, but they're under a lot of threat from disruption. You know, those industries are things like, you know, retail and e-commerce. Uh, of course, we, you know, we're hearing every day, we just heard about, you know, Toys R Us going under. You know, everybody's needing to figure out how to be more competitive. But we also see this commonly in finance, um, particularly in telco and communication service providers, um, definitely in healthcare and advertising and so forth. It's really all these industries where uh, you have a lot of customers you're trying to work with, so you have a scale problem, um, you need to be agile, and the cost to serve is really important. So you know, it's, uh, those are the industries where I think this, this problem is particularly acute, and not surprisingly, those are the you know, customers from those industries are the ones that are coming to talk to us. So what are the big businesses doing about it? You know, how are they trying to address the challenge, at least from our perspective and what we see? Well, one of the things they're doing uh, is seeking advice from experts. Uh, likely some of you on the uh, webcast today are from large enter enterprises, and so you're doing things like listening to the 451 uh, research group, you're talking to trusted IT partners who helped you out in the past. Um, certainly we're seeing with all the enthusiasm around IoT, we're seeing businesses creating a culture of being more data driven by instrumenting everything and storing the data. But as Matt mentioned earlier, simply uh, gathering everything up into a big pile and instrumenting everywhere uh, doesn't give you the insight and the action. You need the applications. And so what we're seeing is uh, quite a few enterprises will try out a use case or two uh, to explore what's possible or to solve a particular pain point. So that's kind of what we're seeing uh, you know, at, at this stage today. But what we find is that when customers come to us um, trying to harness the power of streaming analytics, we find they're already pretty well down one of these three paths. And each of these paths sort of has, has, has its pluses and minuses. The first one being that quite a few of the enterprises that come to us um, have kind of done, gone down an open source, do-it-yourself route. So clearly a lot of people perceive and, and, and know that there's a tremendous innovation happening in open source. So they're trying to harness the, that technology innovation. So one of the approaches is you know, hire a bunch of engineers, hire the, harness the open source innovation. Um, it gives you a lot of control, the path, but the path often takes a very long time to deliver applications into production. In other words, simply taking open source and stitching it together doesn't give you an enterprise-grade application that you can trust to run your business on. Now, maybe if you have large enough scale, you can uh, manage to hire and attract all the talent uh, in order to do this. Um, but quite often, the, the engineers, the technical resources you need are pretty tough to find. So that's the sort of do-it-yourself path. Um, nothing wrong with it, but 
you know, tends to be very long to deliver applications, and if you're trying to be responsive to the market, that can be problematic. So the other place we find is that when customers come to us is, uh, well, maybe they don't want to do it themselves, so they've gone to sort of a generalist, uh, an open source distribution that will give them support on the technologies, and then they, you know, contract professional services engineers to deliver the applications. Um, this can help you deliver the applications faster but the cost is definitely high because um, you're paying off for all those services. Um, and there's a big difference between having support on a technology and knowing how to do, stitch those technologies together to solve a particular use case or deliver an application. So uh, this path is likely responsible for a lot of the ongoing discussion and uh, sort of chatter we're seeing in the market today around the challenge of big data complexity. Um, I think that you know there, there's sort of a drumbeat right now of people scratching their heads about the complexity of delivering big data applications. And I think uh, a lot of this comes down to uh, the technology itself it may not be the challenge. It's people haven't figured out yet how to clearly use the technology for the use cases that they want. And then the third path, which is sort of the most traditional one, is we see that uh, enterprises are deciding, well, I have a particular pain point, so I'm going to get a packaged off-the-shelf solution that's going to solve an immediate need. Um, so that solves your pain point. Um, you get an application very quickly, but it doesn't respond to change particularly well because um, the expectation is you're going to have that application in place maybe for three to five years. So you're not harnessing innovation, um, and it doesn't necessarily help you rapidly address new use cases and new ways of harnessing data. So these are kind of the three paths that we find is that our customers have have spoken to a trusted uh, business partner who's advising them based on sort of what, what has worked in the past, and this is the, you know, one of the three paths they're on. But all three have, have challenges, whether it's time to market or, or the total cost of ownership for delivering applications or whether you're getting agility in delivering those applications. So the question is, you know, in seeking digital transformation and being data-driven and so forth, you know, can, can large enterprises have it all? You know, enterprises want to harness sort of the, the latest and greatest technology, harness open source innovation, because um, that's where we're discovering new ways to use data and to really to predict and act quickly in real time. But to remain competitive, en enterprises can't wait years to deliver new capabilities that drive revenue and protect the business. So at DataTorrent, we think we found a better path. You know, we've been at this open source and big data thing for quite a while, um, and we think we found a path that lets our customers harness the innovation that's taking place in open source, but still lets them deliver applications quickly with enterprise grade. So let me tell you a little bit about how we do that. So the first part of our approach is about having an opinion. So uh, if any of you have looked at what's going on in data processing and data science and machine learning, there are countless technologies in the market today for streaming analytics and data science. It can be pretty overwhelming to know what's best suited to do the job. Um, and what we're seeing is that uh, having an opinion, having a stack that's known to work well uh, can really save you a lot of time in delivering something that's going to work. It's a little bit like what we saw a few years back with the LAMP stack, which was the Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. You know, that combination of technologies, whether it was those specific technologies, but that combination proved very powerful in driving the Internet uh, in its early days. So in the world of streaming applications, we see uh, an emerging pattern, which we call the cache stack, which is, you know, Kafka typically for event delivery, Apex, uh, Apache Apex for in-stream, uh, you know, data processing, uh, Spark for analyzing the data that's at rest and for model and you know, development and machine learning. And then finally, you know, HDFS or some distributed file system for persistent storage. So you know, based on our years of experience at places like Yahoo and EMC and, and many other places, you know, other data-driven businesses, we've really thoughtfully selected the technologies in our stack. And certainly we could debate the merits of one technology or another. Um, but you should never overestimate the power of choosing a platform where the components are tightly integrated. That allows you to focus you know, your energy on your business problems and not so much trying to figure out which combination of technologies is the best combination. So 
So the second part of our approach at DataTorrent is to help our customers understand what's possible with streaming analytics. You know, the, if you recall the, the wheel of use cases that I shared earlier, uh, we have an application factory. Our product features uh, essentially like an app store where we provide business applications and building blocks that serve as an accelerator to help you drive you know, new data-driven products and services quickly. Uh, as part of the application factory, we have a pretty uh, big library of over 70 different pre-built functions for reading from different, different data sources, enriching that data, uh, getting insight from it with analytics and machine learning, and ultimately taking action from that data. So we give a lot of building blocks and pre-built application patterns that will get you to an outcome quickly. You know, recall earlier I mentioned the importance of shipping new capabilities as quickly as possible if you want to be competitive. Most people and most software developers don't start with a blank piece of paper when they're going to do a project or deliver a new product. You know, you start with a pattern that you already know works. So our App Factory applications show you the way and help you save a lot of time in developing new applications and getting to production because we share the patterns that are the best practices for how to get insight out of streaming data. And then the third part of our approach is what we call our epoxy framework. Our epoxy framework is what binds together both the open source components, the cache stack I mentioned earlier, as well as the streaming analytic applications that run on top so that the whole thing can work as one highly reliable and, uh, and operable system. You need a system that you can trust if you're going to run your business on it. Um, and we often get the question, hey, you know, okay, I see what you're doing with the cash stack, with the open source projects, can't I just do that myself? And of course the answer is, is yes, if you have a lot of time and engineering and resources to spend on it. Um, with the epoxy framework, we've done all the hard work for you of making these things um, work together. So for the application developer, our epoxy framework includes everything you need to be able to assemble and express rich and responsive streaming analytic applications. And then for the DevOps guys who need to run this stuff at scale 24-7, uh, our epoxy framework includes all the sort of enterprise integrations you would expect uh, so you can run your applications and the platform in production. These are things like security, uh, concerns over you know, you know, data integrity, re regulatory compliance, monitoring, logging, all that good stuff. These are the things that take a long time to develop when you start with open source alone. Um, and I often kind of chuckle because when you just look at the technology and you stitch it together, getting to your proof of concept can be pretty fast. Uh, and everyone declares victory and says, hooray, the application works. But uh, it's the boring stuff that you have to invest in that actually takes a long time. And I, I joke about it being boring. It's critically important to the enterprise. Uh, all the things you need to wrap around the technology and the applications in order to be able to trust your business on them. And so, you know, that's our epoxy framework. It really uh, helps you get into production with confidence um, and accelerate that time it takes. So, of course, uh, businesses today aren't just seeking technology. They're seeking, the technology, seeking to use that technology to deliver business outcomes quickly. Uh, it seems that as much as we uh, are excited about what's possible with technology, you know, businesses are, are uh, more and more focused on, well, what's it going to do for me? What are the outcomes that are possible, and how can I get them quickly? So at DataTorrent, we've studied this problem pretty closely. Uh, we carefully evaluated all of our customers and their journey in getting their streaming analytic applications into production. Uh, our goal was to understand how, do our customer, how can we get our customers into production quickly by removing obstacles and removing complexity. You know, and this is a, a, a big focus of the big data market over the last year or so, which is all about complexity. Um, we've been focused on trying to remove that complexity the whole time. And most software development projects follow a pretty similar pattern, you know, design and develop, test and certify, uh, launch, and then operate. So during the design and development phase, that first one over on the right there, uh, our opinionated software stack and the pre-built connectors, the application patterns, and so forth in our application factory can help you get to a working application quickly. So this allows you to deliver, you know, an outcome to the business, you know, that's where, where it all starts is, you know, what, what new thing can we do to drive the business forward? But that's just the first step. 
The next step is test and certify, and that's where most proof of concept you know, projects get stuck. So after you declare victory that, that it works, um, then you have a long road to getting ready to, to launch. So that's where the building blocks, the application patterns we provide can be a help because they're already hardened and scale tested. We also make it easy for you to, for your developers to capture and store all the metrics, instrument your applications so you know if you're going to hit or miss an SLA. So often times again, just getting your application up and running uh, is the first step, but there's a lot of additional work to know. Can I trust this application? Can I trust the model that it's using, the predictive analytics? You know, am, am I going to meet my SLA? Am I going to give a good customer experience? So then we get to you know, the next stage, which is launch. So once you know your application works and it's going to scale and it's going to meet your SLA, then a lot of these secondary concerns start to come up, such as security, data integrity, fault tolerance, as well as you know, things like operational tooling and so forth. So you can't get to launch readiness unless your application and platform are ready for production operation. So again, this is where we put a lot of focus in our product is things like monitoring tooling, the user interface, the dashboards and visualizations. These are all the things you need to be able to understand what's going on with the data, what's going on with the application, and finally to know, you know is my application ready for production? This is where a lot of those professional services go, by the way, when you're working with uh, you know, open source directly or even working with sort of an, an open source distribution vendor, a generalist. Um, and as you can see from our analysis, that's really probably where we can save you the most time is getting to launch readiness. And then, of course, once you've launched an application, it doesn't stop there. Uh, supporting, diagnosing, and, and managing large-scale big data systems can be very challenging especially when you're, those systems are 24 by 7 by 365. And most of the streaming analytic applications we see in the market um, are, are not a one-time thing. Once they're running, they, they run continuously. So once you launch your applications, our management tooling helps you get notification and quickly resolve issues before they become a problem. So it's just critically important that you're able to understand what's going on uh, diagnose issues as they come up and resolve them before anyone knows. So this is where we can really help save both time and money where it really counts, which is serving your customers and serving the business. So the bottom line, all of this, you know, uh, it really means that our approach, at least from the, all the engagements we've studied, uh, can really help deliver you into production as much as four times faster than going it alone with just open source directly or with some of those traditional paths that I saved shared earlier. Um, open source is where the innovation is happening, and with our approach, we can help you harness that innovation safely so you can make a positive impact on your business as quickly as possible. So you know, that's kind of summarized our approach. Um, Matt, maybe you'd like to just uh, you know, kind of re-summarize some of your key takeaways, and then I'll, I'll talk about, uh, about our, our jump starts. Yeah, sure. No, I think um, you know, that, that uh, provides some, some good uh, you know, evidence of, of what we were talking about in terms of you know, organizations obviously trying to be you know, more data-driven, and, and part of that being the, you know, the, the, the requirement to uh, you know, query, uh, query their data more frequently and take advantage of of uh, you know continuous data flowing through through the organisation, but you know as we said, the, the importance of focusing on the application and the you know as we we say in so many of the conversations we have with, with users around technology, well, what is it you're actually trying to do? Focus on the application, the business case around that, and, and that the, the data processing capable, capability enables you to deliver. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. And so. So from our perspective at you know, Data Torrent, this then brings up the question, all right, so uh, if you see, hear what we're saying around you know, real-time analytics and stream data processing becoming the new normal, you know, how can you get started? You know, we, you've heard today, and likely you've, if you're here at this talk today, you've, you've heard all about the potential of big data and data science. Um, but you've also likely heard that big data applications can be really difficult to deliver. Now, at DataTorrent, we've been working tirelessly to reduce the complexity of big data projects and at the same time deliver something really new and, and cool, which is real-time applications that drive immediate insight and action. 
So at DataTorrent, we have a jumpstart program that's a low-risk way for you to see what's different about our approach and how you can get to outcomes faster. You know, really our jumpstart uh, relies on that, uh, you know, time to value infographic I shared earlier where we can get you there faster. We're so confident that we can help you get a production ready application stood up and ready um, that we're prepared to guarantee it. So uh, we have a Jumpstart Guarantee. It's a program that essentially gives you everything you need to get a production ready application developed um, in 60 days or less. And so one way you could get started here is try it out. Uh, and you know, we're prepared to stand behind our, our promise that we can get you to a production ready application quickly because we're confident that our, our solution does a great job in reducing that complexity. So we, you know, we, we invite you to talk to us and, and try it out. But before that, let's, uh, let's now go to, um, to some questions from the audience and, and see what kinds of uh, questions we can answer for you. Hey everybody, just a reminder, it's now time for our Q&A session. Uh, simply type your question in the box below and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, now let Nathan and Matt take over from here. Yeah, and one of the first questions I see here, um, which is a good one I think for, for me and Matt, which is, um, so event stream processing has been around for decades, well maybe not decades, but uh, well at least in financial services certainly event processing has been around for decades. But you know, stream processing has been around for a while. So what's changed that more companies are adopting it now? So I'll, I'll go first on that one and then see what Matt's perspective is. Um, I think there's several things going on. One is, you know, there is this drive towards digital transformation, which really means getting more responsive to your customer and to your market. And in order to know how to respond, that requires data. And so the more, the sooner I can know what's going on, the more responsive I can be. So I think that's one of the things that's driving uh, streaming analytics. I think the other thing is that we're seeing um, increasingly sort of a, a broad movement towards uh, Customers expecting that their service providers are using data uh, to make them more effective. So in other words, as a result of Amazon and a lot of other places, you see that uh, as a customer, I'm expecting my providers to use data about me in real time to empower me and, and make my interaction with my supplier more productive. And I'm going to choose the suppliers who use data, who are data-driven and responsive, over the other ones. So it really comes down to competitiveness. So I think, you know, these, these different trends are coming together and, and, and really causing enterprises to have to look very carefully at these technologies because ultimately it's what's going to allow them to continue to be competitive. Matt, do you want to comment yeah. on that one as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think you're right. I mean, obviously, as you say, you know, sort of event processing has been around for a long time, particularly in financial services. And I think, you know, what, what I've seen, you know, historically, was uh, you know th those kind of uh, offerings were well they, they were they were expensive um, and they were you know you needed a certain you know very specific skills to to actually to use them and also they're, they're partly because they were proprietary and I think what the the big thing that we've seen over you know the last sort of you know five years or so is, and you mentioned that the huge amount of innovation that's happening in open source and. You know, because there's a the, the number of, I think within just the Apache Software Foundation, there's all, you know four or five, perhaps more different stream processing projects. And so there's a huge amount of choice. It's lowered the barriers to to entry, but also, as you say, it's you know it's not just about the technology getting cheaper and more freely available. It's about the use cases um, and the customer demand. And yeah, I mean, some of that, the um, the data I shared earlier was actually from. Uh, some of my generated from some of my colleagues now, sort of customer experience uh, channel, and what we're seeing there is, as you just said, that it's the customers that are demanding from their suppliers, you know, from their from their vendors, because they expect to, uh, you know, have that that uh, uh, you know data driven r responsiveness from from their from their providers, uh, and as you say, if they don't get it from from you know, you they'll go and get it from somewhere else. So it's it's both the technology's got a lot you know easier and more freely available and a lot cheaper, and uh, and also customers are just demanding these these applications. That's right. So we're kind of seeing a, a confluence of events. Customers are more demanding. Uh, we're instrumenting the world uh, in in new and interesting ways, so we can be more data driven. Um, and the applications, you know, are, are the new applications of that data are coming fast and furious. So uh, a couple of uh, 
quick housekeeping questions that people are raising. So one of them, yes, we will be sharing the slides. Um, someone else joined late, uh, and I do believe we'll have the uh, recording of the webinar that you can watch later. Um, and now another interesting question from the audience here, uh, it, which is, uh, let me read it out loud. You know, what would be your suggestion for a customer who is just running with sort of traditional data warehouse BI, um, integrating a few ERP systems, who wants to step into stream processing and real-time analytics? Should they start with open source tools or try some distribution vendors? So a um, few comments there. One of them is, uh, so certainly if you are a large enterprise with a data warehouse and so forth, if you're not looking at stream processing, if you're, if you're buying what Matt and I are telling you today, um, you should be evaluating this. But then your next question, which is, should you just start with open source tools or start, try a distribution vendor? Well, uh, you may want to experiment and look at the open source stuff that's out there, but if you follow what I shared earlier about these different paths, if you go with open source alone, uh, you may be able to learn a bit about what's possible, um, but that may not get you to an impact on the business very quickly because you may have a hard time finding the talent and you won't know which open source tools to try. Um, if you go to a distribution vendor, that's a, perhaps a better step, um, but again, uh, the distribution vendor is going to know a lot about the technology but may not be focused quite on the use cases. And so obviously with a, you know, to me, and with what I shared earlier, that's a little bit of a second trap, which is you may end up spending a lot of money on professional services trying to deliver a use case. So of course, uh, as data torrent, I would suggest, uh, you know, talk to us, but the, the first part of that is, you know, look at where, what are your unique data assets? Where are the opportunities for you to be more data driven and to adopt more of a culture of being data driven and sort of continuous data processing uh, and data integration, but then ultimately identify the applications that are going to help drive revenue uh, and protect the business using those unique data assets. So our recommendation would be, you know, of course, uh, pick a use case, uh, look at your unique data assets, and then come to us because likely we can help you get your first application up and running very quickly. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say I'd go along with that. I think, you know, the fact, as we said, the fact that all these uh, open source projects are out there and freely available, is, you know, gives everyone a, a great head start to be able to just play around and figure out which one is potentially suitable for their needs. But as you say, I, I think it, where we see sometimes companies can get in trouble is they, they focus too much on, on that, you know, focus too much on the technology and, and, you know, it needs to be driven by a business case. So, yeah, I think there's a... There's a, a, you know, there's a balance to, to be struck, but yeah, it's a great opportunity to, to take advantage of those that are being freely available to, to figure out which one is potentially appropriate to your, to your requirements and then engage with, you know, with, a, with a vendor uh, from, that, from that position. Yeah. And so uh, let's see, a couple more questions. We have just a few more minutes before uh, we're at the top of the hour. Um, one of the questions here was about our application factory uh, at DataTorrent. Is it more relevant to larger or more established enterprises or can even you know, startups benefit from it? So uh, no, it's not necessarily only for large enterprises. Um, the app factory uh, consists of you know, pre-built applications. Now these aren't completely packaged because we expect you're going to have to inject your business logic and make some changes, but applications, you know, building blocks and connectors. Uh, to different data sources. And so whether you're a startup or a large enterprise, um, the application factory, the patterns that are in there, and the building blocks uh, can help you see what's possible with streaming analytics, regardless of the scale um, of your business. So no, it's, it's really these, these applications are there to help you show you the way, um, whether you're a small organization or a large one. Our point about large enterprises earlier is that it's the large enterprises that typically have uh, a data problem, meaning a lot of data, and an agility problem. And so um, they're the ones who are, uh, you know, frankly, under threat from a lot of the startups that are using the same technology but have more agility to deliver the applications. And then one other question that was in here, uh, someone was asking about, um, you know, training and certification and so forth. Um, you know, certainly contact DataTorrent. We offer quarterly training if you're interested, so uh, just reach out to us um, and we can get you signed up for one of our next uh, training programs. 
Hey, now that we and are so, coming down to the hour. Go ahead, Duran. Yep. I realized that we we're coming down to the hour, so I just wanted to say, you know, all other questions that we have, we'll be able to get to it after the webinar. And I did want to thank Matt and Nathan for a great presentation and thank everybody for joining today's webcast. Uh, as a reminder, we will have the on-demand version of this webcast on Bright Talk. And on behalf of Data Torn and 451 Research, we just want to thank everybody for attending today's webcast and have a phenomenal day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for attending. Thanks,